Yeah, uh, good morning. We are talking about uh, doing things with our computers and we want them to be fast. So sometimes we don't care, just do it by the book, but today we talk about doing things fast. So why do we do this? One thing could be that we have a day job where the challenges are mostly non-technical, people issues, whatever, and then you want to do something cool at night. Sometimes you have day jobs where you need to get things done <coughs> efficiently. I give you two examples. Once we had to sort mails, physical paper mails. We sorted them on the computer and then we printed them and then the post uh, took up the container and distributed it. You get the data like three hours before the post picks the container and then you have like one hour to uh, do math about it and then you print it in two hours and then we are, when you're not done then it comes the next day and that's really bad. So there you have kind of time constraints, you need your job done in a certain time, no other way. Another example, you have a web interface and we had a graph that represented something. And this data for the graph were uh, acquired and then we had to make something visible that was uh, useful for the user. But if you kind of have a web uh, application and then you wait like 20 minutes and then you see something good, then it's not good anymore. People are already drinking coffee, nobody's going to see it. So you have a time constraint there and you need to be fast. So uh, that's the reason why these things sometimes matter. Find your own places where you need it. And uh, we take as an example sorting which is kind of the most basic thing. Usually you just take the standard library, it does it for you basically actually quite well. But yeah, we can sometimes do better than that. So, the first question is, what do you see here? Any idea? Is it Los Angeles or Kiev or whatever? No, it's Robinson Crusoe's island. So, just think of Robinson Crusoe, he has all this stuff on his island and there's no other guy. Friday hasn't arrived yet, so what does it mean? You can do whatever you want. You don't have any traffic rules, no speed limit, no size limit, whatever, unless you have bridges that are too small, whatever. And you can use oversized vehicles, drive on the right or left or whatever you like. Doesn't matter. It's your place. And now, we come to another world. Suddenly there's uh, other people in the same place. And if we don't have any reasonable rule set, then we are all dead after one week. So we need to have some uh, concepts how we work with each other. And functional programming is not the only way, but it is one way that works well for very high <laughs> level of uh, crowdedness. So, the thing, some, just two things that we are uh, caring about is like sharing objects. If you share objects around, like the typical collection or something like that in the Java world, and you put in stuff, take out stuff, delete stuff, and then you get weird errors. Or the program is just not working correctly. But if they are mut uh, immutable, it's okay. Can't happen. Same thing is if you have functions and then you use them in multiple threads, it's dangerous. But only if they have side effects. By the way, it's not only about multi-threading. You have this issue of re-entrance and you can very well write uh, single-threaded programs that do weird things here, especially yeah, with mutable uh, objects that uh, do very weird things or very weird crashes. You don't need multiple threads for that, but multiple threads make it even more interesting. So, here we go. Uh, immutability is our uh, solution, but the problem is it means if we have big collections, each time we change something, we have to make, make a new copy. And copy big collection. I talk 50 million records, something like that. You don't want to do it with every step. So uh, that's kind of the problem that we have to deal with. And uh, so there's a point that you can see that uh, we can tweak our algorithms to work with immutable structures, mostly or more or less. Like if you use merge sort, then you have two st uh, structures and you uh, read from them and then you put it into a new one and then basically you are on a good path 
but uh, it constrains you very much. And we are talking about speed and not about uh, keeping to constraints that uh, make it harder. So I did some experiments. It was two years ago, so maybe it's a little bit different now. But uh, when you use the um, immutable collection of uh, Scala, it was basically totally unusable. And you could use the mutable one, and it kind of worked. I just give you a hint, I did the same with closure, and the uh, uh, immutable one was quite okay. It was just 30% slower. So maybe Scala has uh, um, features like this as well, or collections like this as well now. Uh, if not, I would recommend, it's a good idea to look what the Clojure guys did, they really did good stuff. And I think Scala could do the same, there's no reason that it's constrained to Clojure. So, anyway, here we go. For the moment, even 30% slower is not what we want. We want speed, not 30%. So, we can talk, think about this. We have this uh, big city, whatever, but then in the city we have our garden which looks kind of similar, but this is our garden, and the garden we do whatever we want. For the moment, like a single friend, but we'll go next step later. So this is uh, just the same. You have probably seen the similar picture uh, many times. You have the red one, that's kind of the nice area where we are in the pure functional world, where we do everything right. Then the problem is we want our program to do something useful uh, instead of just using electricity. So we need some interaction with the outside world. We heard in the beginning of the first talk it's not side effects, it's effects. And effects are good and side effects are bad only. But this thing uh, does something. It needs to have effects, otherwise we just waste our electricity. And the other thing is, which... Uh, I am making the point here, you can have a garden. You can put an area of your program where you do something, but when you leave the garden, you need to keep the rule of the game. You can't just say, okay, I do my garden. Like, for example, in Java world, you do collections in your garden, and then you just wrap it as an uh, unmodifiable list. That's not enough. It's not going to help you because then you still have the back door to modify it and you can still blow everything and it's happening. So don't do that, you really have to, for example in this case, to copy it, but only once and that we can afford because we have really big things and uh, copying big things is big but the thing that we do is non-linear so we still gain. So uh, the point is whatever you do in, the, in your garden should not in any way be observable from outside that you do anything bad there. Then you are not doing anything bad there. So, why are we bothering? I already gave you motivation in the beginning, but in the end of the day we want to go faster than what our uh, out-of-the-box thing allows us. So, uh, we can use uh, different implementations and do better tuning and whatever. And, uh, we can use, in this case of sorting, knowledge of our data. And actually, we learn, if you study anything of the uh, algorithm, we learn the best thing we can do for sorting is O, big O of n log n. But that is in the assumption that we know nothing at all about our data. But actually, we know what we have. We write the program to do certain things. We know our strings, our names, addresses, uh, text in certain language or text in the union of certain language, whatever you like, but you know about it. And we know to use this knowledge. And if we do, we can make sorting in an ideal world O big, big O of n. And then we can beat any algorithm if the data is just big enough. In the end of the day, if you sort like a couple million records, then it's a little bit faster. And if you sort a billion, then it's uh, significantly faster. But uh, if you do it a lot of times, you will gain from it. That's really um, possible. So, uh, that's the thing, it's called flash sort. I don't know why, it's not very well known, but we'll see on the next pages, it has a reason why it's not well known. Uh, but, yeah, here we see. Uh, the thing that we have as additional requirement is we need to provide a second hash function. 
And this hash function we usually generate it some way automatically, kind of works. But uh, in this case, we can't. We really have to worry. This <coughs> thing is the hard part. So maybe it takes a week or a month to write it. So that's the thing. This thing has to be compatible with sorting. So you call it monotonic in math. So why not take the diagonal? Well, it doesn't work because that doesn't give us the gain. We need to look which objects occur more often. And where the objects occur more often, we make this thing steeper. That means the places where it's crowded, we make wider. And the places where it's not crowded, we flatten. For example, let's say we, talk, we sort uh, texts that are Russian and English mixed. Then Chinese characters are very rare. So for Chinese characters, we can make it really flat. And if there is one, it still works, but it doesn't work fast. That's good, and we win. But then when we really want to make it good, then we have to know which characters occur more often and which combinations. And then you can really tune it. So that's the point. If you write it mathematically, it looks like this. You have a function m. I don't call it second hash function. It's an ugly name, so I call it metric. But uh, just think of it. It's something like a more sophisticated hash function. I use long values there. The reason is uh, how we work. We just cut off the, we divide it by something. And then we get to something in a reasonable range. And if we do that, then the most significant digits count more. So we have to use them heavily. And with that, we get to, get to something useful. So the way that we do it, just to give you an idea, and I think if you um, use this, you can come up by yourself by an implementation. It's not that hard. Metric is the hard part. You just go through once the whole thing. Uh, you know how many objects there are, and then you say, OK, I have this many objects. I have a number of buckets that is like half of the number of drop checks that I have, one fifth, whatever number of buckets you take, slightly less than the number of objects. And then you, have, you count, uh, you, you uh, divide your metric function by something so that it's in a range between zero and the number of uh, buckets that you have. And then for each object you calculate this thing and you know which bucket it goes. Then you do one pass, you count how many times each bucket occurs, what are the sizes. And then you do some, uh, like a scalar trick, uh, go through this thing once, and then instead of the sizes, you have the starting and the end positions. And then you go through all your data and put each object into its bucket, into the first free position. And then when you are through with this pass, and everything is in place, just with a one tiny little bit uh, problem that the bucket where all the Chinese characters are might be right big because suddenly there is a lot of Chinese text in your thing anyway. Or even in normal cases there is two, three, five, twenty, whatever objects in one bucket. So you still need to sort the buckets. But if you do your thing well, the buckets are small. So you can sort them with any stupid algorithm you like, it's fast. It's just 20 objects, so you do it easily. <coughs> and then you're done. That's it. Uh, if you want to do it a little bit better, you can do it in place. You don't need a second copy, and then you can spend some time. But it's not that hard, actually. Metric is the hard part. So the reason why don't we use this thing all the time, why we bother about the other thing is, that it's this hard thing, the metric. We don't have it, and we can't have do it universally. We need to optimize it for our use case. So, let's see. That's, uh, that's already giving us a good speed up, but now we have another issue, and that's quite interesting. Even these tiny cheap laptops for a couple hundred uh, euros have more multiple cores. And the servers where we do our real work, uh, of course, as well. So we only use one. And now I forget what the last speaker said in the last uh, minute, but no, I don't. 
we may use multiple cores because we need it and they give us a benefit. So we want to parallelize uh, the sorting so that we can uh, make use of it. And actually, it's uh, quite easy because it's really something that is so good for parallelizing. I have <coughs> hardly seen anything else that works so well. We just split it into equal sections. So we have eight cores, we split it into eight sections and let each thread sort one section. We just write our sorting algorithm slightly different that it has a start and end point and then we <coughs> don't need any locking, any stupid thing. We just let them run and hope we have written it correctly. They don't tread on each other's feet. Yeah? And then we see it's this garden. We have our garden and we just split our garden with internal fences into different areas and that's it. Only problem, of course, then we have sort of these gardens and we need to merge it. But there is this thing called merge sort. If you have multiple, you can sort merge them in one step. I experimented a little bit. You have a reduced version of heap sort and then you can merge it in one step and get something out of it. It's uh, possible, but uh, whatever you like, you are almost done with it and it makes uh, things faster. Okay, so the point is, you have the rules, follow them, understand them, make things as simple as possible, but not simpler as possible, and uh, understand what the rules mean. They are not there to make our lives harder, they are there to make our lives better. And keep the APIs clean. That's really the point. You can do some ugly stuff inside, but then in the end you have to come up with an API that is self-explanatory, not like a door handle which works kind of weird and you have a thousand side manual and you just read it and then of course it's clear. No, you should be clear when you look at it, it works like this, it should be like this. And of course keep our functional rules. And uh, we have freedom for our internal implementation. That's behind the door, nobody looks most of the time. And if yes, I mean I put my source code for your amusement on GitHub so you can have some fun in using this stuff. And uh, yeah, use the power of your hardware. We have multiple cores, even on this <coughs> stupid laptop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it, guys. You have any questions? 